Thanks. Good morning. Um, wow, Spark, sparse crowd. I guess it's a Friday presentation. So uh, this work that I'm going to present today is actually on the vulnerability of drinking water access. Okay, most of the talks in this session seem to be more uh, water, quality, water quantity, water resources focused. This is specifically about drinking water and access to drinking water. This is work that I did as a postdoc when I was at UNC. Um, the four authors between me and uh, my postdoc advisor, Jamie Bartram, are actually either undergrads or gap year students um, who uh, did an incredible job supporting this project. And um, uh, I, I wanted to just acknowledge them before we start, just because I know I've got 45 slides and uh, I don't think I'm going to have much time for the acknowledgments at the end. Okay, so um, how do I move forward? Do I click, just click the mouse? Okay. Great. So the big question um, that this work falls under would be uh, how will climate change impact drinking water and sanitation access? And that was a question that my postdoc advisor asked me to look into. Uh, I told him it was a multifaceted question, probably unanswerable. I delayed for a couple months. Eventually he, he scheduled a presentation for me to present on the topic, so I had to look into it. Um, so uh, what I, ha I had to narrow down the question. So I started asking which aspects were answerable using available data and methods, uh, the resources of our research group in particular. Uh, that lacked a credible answer in the literature and that were amenable to updating as new data emerged. So the question we settled on was what is the current vulnerability of drinking water access uh, to climate related hazardous events? So it's a global analysis. Uh, at this point we're not yet looking to the future so this is kind of establishing a baseline based on recent data and uh, the, the hazard events that we had access to were flood, drought, and cyclone. So to do this analysis we needed five categories of global data. We needed uh, data on climate-related hazardous events, so that was flood, drought, and cyclone. Human populations, uh, population density, um, drinking water access, uh, the sensitivity of that drinking water access to flood, drought, and cyclone, and, uh, and adaptive capacity data. Uh, the model that I built um, is based on, uh, or the model that we built, I should say, is based on um, a, a review of vulnerability literature that's uh, a review manuscript that's actually in review right now. Um, but they, they, I, I kind of chose the most common methods uh, that have been used um, for assessing uh, vulnerability to climate change. Um, we index each parameter from zero to one, which is a, a com the most common indexing method that's been used. And then we aggregated uh, our variables uh, using an additive model, where vulnerability equals exposure plus sensitivity minus adaptive capacity. Adaptive capacity is just different directionally than the others. That's why it's minus instead of plus. So um, in terms of the data sources that we used, uh, the Columbia University Center for Hazardous Risk Research had data on, uh, climate, on uh, flood, drought, and cyclone. Uh, Global Grid, we had data, we had used a data set from roughly 1980 to, to 2000 we had for each of those. Um, we used risk deciles for each Global Grid cell, that's what um, they've presented. We actually used the frequency of events or the occurrence of the events over that time, not the outcomes, because the outcomes are, conf are confounded by um, sensitivity and adaptive capacity terms. So we wanted just a raw uh, exposure term. So this is what their flood map looks like, um, just as an example. And when you zoom in, uh, you can see here Thailand is an example country. Cyclone, uh, drought frequency, flood frequency. Um, you can see that the data sets are at different resolution. Um, there are uh, some areas of the country that don't re aren't really exposed to, to uh, a given hazard type, others that are. Um, anyway, that's, uh, that's what the data looked like underneath for population density, for, uh, for hazards. For population density, we use LandScan, which is about a kilometer by kilometer global grid. Um, great data set. Uh, and we use that to assign each cell to be either urban or rural, which we needed for our drinking water access um, data set, which I'll, I'll talk about uh, briefly. But here's what Sierra Leone like, looks like on the LandScan data set, population density, super high res. Um, Great data set. So combining the first two data sets to get our exposure score, um, we use the flood, drought, cyclone occurrence. We use the population data uh, layers um, generated from LandScan. And that gave us an exposure score, which was, was kind of a semi-quantitative. We're using deciles here. You know, we're not using actual, um, actual count of the events, but the, the, the risk deciles. A semi-quantitative surrogate for the average per capita risk of being exposed to a given climate hazard okay, in, in a given location. So here's what Thailand looks like once you put the uh, LandScan population density data set in. And you can see there's a big concentration of red in Bangkok. That's because there's a lot of people at Bangkok, OK? So um, at this point, um, the, uh, the higher the population density and the more the hazard, the higher the, the cell value. And we actually, in our model, we, we divide by total population for the country so to, to um, factor that in. So it is actually population weighted. 
So you have the occurrence of flood in the cell times the population of the cell is the cell exposure score. Sum all the cell exposure scores over the country, divide by the population of the country, that gives you the country level exposure score. Okay, we did that for flood, drought, and cyclone, and then we index those and summed them up um, to get our total country level exposure score. That's the E term in our, um, in our model. Uh, that was pub this stuff was published earlier this year, that piece of the model. Um, Elizabeth Christensen, who was one of the, the gap year students, is the first author on that paper. So next, we, we want, need to incorporate the drinking water access. Our data source was the World Health Organization UNICEF Joint Monitoring Program data set. It's kind of the global um, uh, gold standard. It's used for the Millennium Development Goal tracking and everything. Um, they have country level estimates of urban and rural data on improved drinking water um, that they publish every year or two years, depending um, in, in, their, in their annual reports. In 2006, we had um, we actually had really high, really um, data that, that, that went into um, into that improved category in more detail. So it actually had de detail on um, water pipe to home or plot, of whether people have protected wells, rainwater harvesting, public stand post, um, protected spring as their, as their water source. So these, you know, drinking water access doesn't surprise anyone. It varies widely between countries. It very, varies widely between urban and rural areas in a country. Uh, these data were necessary um, for determining sensitivity. So the sensitivity of drinking water access, we use the World Health Organization DFID data set, Vision 2030. It is a qualitative expert-based assessment of the sensitivity of those drinking water access types or technologies to the hazards that we're using, the flood, drought, and cyclone. So um, we uh, assigned uh, quantitative multipliers to those expert-based um, those expert-based sensitivities um, to generate uh, our sensitivity score. Um, here's what the uh, Here's what they look like. You've got the drinking water access types on the Y, the, the hazard types on the, on the X. Um, green is good, red is bad. Um, the dark, unimproved is, is, uh, is the worst. So uh, we need to gen generate a sensitivity score. Um, so we generate a sensitivity profile for each cell. Okay, the sensitivity profile for a cell is the percent of people in a given cell that use a, a given drinking water technology. And, um, uh, and the sensitivity of those technologies to a given hazard. So again, we're taking the cell, we're taking um, the values for the cells, we're summing those up over the whole country, dividing them by the total population of the country. That gives us our scores, our, uh, our sensitivity scores for flood. Um, you can, we'd also do that for cyclone and drought. We get our total sensitivity score, that's our S in our model. Um, adaptive capacity, we use the Notre Dame gain index. Readiness score, we use readiness because it doesn't include uh, water, um, or drinking water variables, parameters in that score. We don't want to double count our variables, so this is just kind of a, a raw adaptive capacity um, with economic, social, and governance factors. Um, game was available for nearly every country. For, there were four countries out of 173 that didn't have it, so we had to use, a, we had to use some other, um, other adaptive capacity terms. Uh, adaptive capacity, you see New Zealand, Australia, Singapore, Switzerland, Denmark, Finland at the top, Sudan, Eritrea, Myanmar, Zimbabwe, Iraq, and North Korea at the bottom. Um, I hope I don't get hacked for, uh, for pointing that out. Um, so the country level gain readiness score, uh, we, we use our adaptive capacity term. Those scores were squared. We only had, a country, we only had country level scores. So the, those scores were squared to represent both the local and the national adaptive capacity. We're trying to get more nuance in our adaptive capacity term. Um, but basically we take the gain score, oh, it's indexed zero to one, square it. That gives us our, uh, our AC term in there. So now we're ready to sum up and get to vulnerability. Here's our model again. So this generated a ton of data. So we had um, every country, urban, rural, and national, exposure sensitivity, vulnerability, flood, drought, cyclone, and the total multi-hazard uh, terms. So what I'm going to focus on here um, is just the national level exposure and vulnerability. So out of 173 countries for which we had adequate data, uh, we, placed, we ranked those and placed them in quintiles uh, on these maps. Red is bad, green is good. And again, I'm just going to show eight of those 30-some uh, maps that we generated from this. So, so for flood exposure first, um, you can look at this. You see a lot of uh, flood exposure risk. The, um, Southeast Asia, um, lots of risk of exposure um, down in South America, some in, um, uh, some in Sub-Saharan Africa. When you actually account for the, um, for the drinking water access and the adaptive capacity, uh, the results change quite a bit. You see in Sub-Saharan Africa a lot of red. Um, as you might expect. Still in Southeast Asia, there's a lot, there's a lot of red. Um, the, um, the orange is the, is the second most, um, second highest risk category. You can see India and China, examples of big countries with, uh, with high risk. Uh, drought, likewise, um, you see this distribution. 
um, Sub-Saharan Africa, more, more exposure to drought. Uh, South Asia, Southeast Asia, lots of exposure. Uh, when it comes to vulnerability, that shifts a little bit. Um, you can see uh, some movement. And I'll talk about some specific countries and how they move through this um, exposure uh, to vulnerability um, uh, in, in the, uh, this, those two different terms. So in cyclones, cyclone was more localized throughout the world. Most populations in the world weren't exposed to a lot of cyclones. However, when you look at vulnerability, the vulnerability in, of, uh, of drinking water to cyclone is, is still um, quite high in, um, in sub-Saharan Africa, Southeast Asia. Um, and in terms of total exposure, once you sum all those three, you know, these are un unweighted, uh, just cyclone drought and, and, uh, and flood. Um, when you sum those, the total exposure um, highest, if you look at uh, South Asia, Asia, some in East Asia, uh, South America, Africa, um, and then for vulnerability, a lot of that shifts um, to Sub-Saharan Africa, um, still a lot of vulnerability in South Asia, Southeast Asia. So examples of a few countries and how they moved from exposure to vulnerability can provide some insight into what some of the key um, factors were in, um, in reducing vulnerability uh, to these events. So um, you can see here South Korea, Japan, the United States, uh, South Korea and Japan in the top 10 in terms of their population exposure to these, um, to these hazard events. But when you incorporate uh, good drinking water access, um, utility managed pipe systems for, for the most part, uh, and their high adaptive capacity that moves them kind of into the bottom half of the, uh, of the distribution in terms of vulnerability. The USA is another example where it's kind of towards the, um, the top third in terms of exposure of the population. But once you factor in good drinking water access, high adaptive capacity, it moves into the, uh, the bottom quintile for, um, for total vulnerability. Uh, there are other countries that are moving the opposite way. So Afghanistan's an example. Um, around number 30 in terms of their exposure, but uh, number one in terms of vulnerability. Myanmar, Eritrea, Togo, other, other examples of countries with poor drinking water uh, access, technologies that are not very, uh, not very resilient to the hazards that they're facing, uh, moving uh, into the more vulnerable space. And then you have examples of countries like Finland and Iceland that are wealthy, that have high, sen uh, uh, high adaptive capacity, low sensitivity, um, and also aren't, very, aren't highly exposed to the hazards. So they make up kind of the block of countries with the lowest vulnerability. Um, overall, top 15 in terms of um, vulnerability and bottom 15 in terms of vulnerability. So those that are most, uh, most vulnerable to loss of drinking water access, um, Afghanistan, Somalia, Mozambique, Chad, um, countries uh, with a lot of conflict, poor countries. Uh, you also see Bangladesh there at number eight. Um, their protected wells actually provide a decent amount of resilience to the hazards they're facing, but, uh, but still, they're well known to be uh, highly exposed to, uh, to these hazard events. Um, on the, uh, the least vulnerable side, you see a lot of Northern European countries. Um, New Zealand and Australia did show up in there, as well as Sing uh, Singapore, um, but m not many surprises um, in terms of our, our model results, which I guess is a, is a good thing that, it, um, that the results are somewhat intuitive. So um, in summary, uh, this is part of a broader question about the vulnerability of drinking water and sanitation access to climate change. It's an ongoing project um, that I've continued working on while I've been at the University of Alabama uh, with my colleagues back at UNC. Um, so we chose a well-defined but narrower question than that big question. Uh, we tried to use the best uh, available global data sets. Um, overall, exposure had a large impact on country level vulnerability, but it could be compensated for, especially in wealthy countries that had very good drinking water uh, technology and high adaptive capacity. So um, what we're doing uh, for what we want to do in the future is uh, we want to implement some automated updating as new data emerge. Um, we had an undergrad who could code some things in Python for us so we could easily add new data sets. Um, we want to add new data years and look at changes in vulnerability over time uh, when we have good enough data. Uh, we want to refine our quantification methods. We want to weight some of these. We want to change the weighting of some of these parameters if we can, um, if, if it's justifiable. We want to integrate aridity, groundwater depletion, and, and, uh, and sea level, um, and, and how close populations are to the coast. And of course, we want to look at climate change projections. Uh, regional analysis. There's a country level analysis of the U.S. Uh, that's county based. Uh, that's um, that's, in, uh, that's been submitted for, for publication now. Uh, field validation and case studies, we want to look at recent historical data on hazard events across different sites and loss of drinking water access, and also um, look at a sanitation analysis. I want to acknowledge uh, the Wallace Genetic Foundation for funding this, this work, and uh, colleagues at UNC, at the UNC Water Institute, who are not listed as, um, as authors, uh, Jeannie Liu and Ademo Ojomo. And with that, I'd like to open it up for questions.